You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome to the latest episode of the Command Zone. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai. And I'm DJ. We are here today to discuss an article, <laughs> but it's from, <laughs> it's an article from the godfather, I call him, of our format. Oh, yeah. So Sheldon Mennery, uh, he helped create the whole Commander format. Yeah, he's one of the founding fathers. Important probably, guy. Probably the single most important person to the creation of Commander. Oh, yeah. Uh, so really important person came out with a super interesting article. And uh, it kind of created a little bit of a buzz in the Commander format. And that buzz extended over into the Command Zone office where Josh and I couldn't stop talking about... Sheldon Mennery's article. Yeah, the article is called Commander Cards You Shouldn't Play and was basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a list of cards Sheldon thinks players should generally avoid putting in their decks. Uh, yep, certainly sparked a lot of conversation. We're going to have some good discussion about it here today. The whole concept of the idea of are there cards you shouldn't play, specifically what did Sheldon put on his list, what might be on a similar list for DJ and I. A lot mm -hmm. to go into, but before we get into all that... You're going to hear about a bunch of cards this episode that various people think you should not play. Are but you, you might be like, I know, I like that card and I want to buy it. And if you do, you could go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone and uh, you can order your magic product, your singles, all the cards we're going to talk about today, uh, anything at all. And when you use that affiliate link, you really are supporting this show. You're supporting game nights. You're supporting extra turns which if you haven't heard is our new gameplay series. If you haven't watched it, you should check it out. You're supporting all of our content and you're just doing something you're already gonna do, buy magic cards. Mm -hmm. And you just get thrown in for free as gravy, all of our content. And a big thank you also to Ultra Pro who supports again, all of our content. You can find their products at your LGS, at online retailers like Card Kingdom. They have really cool Black Lotus themed stuff that's uh, come out now. There's like play mats. Sleeves, deck boxes, dice bags. There's mm. life counter notepads. There's a uh, cloth wall scroll. If you're on YouTube, you're looking at all the stuff right now. It's beautiful. You do want it to uh, spice up your game room. You know, just like the history of Manalia scroll back there. And the yeah. last way to support the show is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. In fact, we call out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to David Caston. David. You rock. Thanks, David. I want to say David uh, joined recently. So he's a recent addition to our Patreon. Big thanks to David and everybody else who joined recently. Maybe it was because of Extra Turns. That's a show we're trying to get off the ground and create more of. And if you liked it and want us to keep doing it, Patreon is a good way to encourage us to do so. Okay. Main topic. Are there cards you should not play? So again, Sheldon Mennery. If you don't know who Sheldon Mennery is, let me just run it down really quick. He's basically the guy that popularized Commander. He's the person who really got it out there to the public, not necessarily the singular inventor of it, but the person who is has been the face of it for a very long time. Sheldon is on the rules committee. It, I guess it's possible that people play Commander and don't even really realize how it works. So of all the formats, modern, legacy, standard. They're run by Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast maintains the rules. They maintain the ban list. Commander's not like that. Commander was a fan-created format and is run by a, what's called a rules committee, the RC, which is a small group of people that don't work at Wizards. Actually, I think Wizards has like one person on the rules committee so that they can be involved in it, but they, they don't control it and they don't always know what the rules committee is gonna do and they don't, they can't tell the commander format, like ban this card. They can suggest it and maybe hopefully convince them, but they don't have that level of control of the format. Sheldon's on the rules committee. So he is one of the people that is most responsible for what happens with our format, not just bans, but they do rules changes too. Yeah, that's right. We've had uh, different colors adding adding mana to outside of your commander's color identity. Uh, we've had, I mean, Tuck I rule. think people, yeah, I think people most focus on uh, the bands, but also the tuck rule, like you said, mulligans. Yeah, we went well. to the Vancouver mulligan. It used to be partial Paris. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of maintaining of our format, um, and we can talk about. We don't want to need to talk about each one of those things, but they're definitely an important presence uh, for our game. I mean, Sheldon's got to be one of the most important people for Commander just because of his voice on the Rules Committee. Also does write articles and speak often about Commander. And Sheldon also has a podcast. It's called Elder Dragon Statesman, where they discuss 
the Commander format. And if you're interested in listening to that podcast, you will be able to find the um, link in the show notes. And again, Sheldon is an important guy to the format, so listening to his stuff and reading his articles is going to give you a little bit of a look into his mind and how he thinks about the format and might give you a little look into where the format might go. Yeah. And we have a little bit of a look into his mind too, with this most recent article uh, that he put out titled, you know, commander cards, you shouldn't play, but talking about Sheldon, I also want to mention a little bit of background about him personally. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 So Sheldon recently had some health problems. He had to go in for surgery. And one thing that we want to let everyone know and Sheldon too, is that we really wish him a speedy recovery. I think it's, we're all behind him and we really want him to, to get better and keep doing what he's doing. If we are critical of something in this episode, we're critical of Sheldon's arguments, not the man himself. Listen, I've met Sheldon. He's a very nice guy. Also, he's we're a all very... adults. We can argue at like a, a thing, a, a good level. You know what I mean? I wish him nothing but the best. Absolutely. And, uh, you can tell DJ is going to disagree with him a little bit. And I might even <laughs> too, and I have been known to in the past, but Sheldon is a very smart guy, a very articulate guy. He has done great things. We would not be here without him. So we wish him the best. And I'm glad that his surgery yeah, uh, he went seems well. to have yeah. gone well. It's a long road to yeah. recovery, but uh, it seems to have gone really well. So we're happy for that. Okay. So let's talk about the article here. Um, you've written down some stuff, DJ. <laughs> this article really hit you, so <laughs> I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you take it from here. Okay. Well, actually, um, Sheldon, Sheldon. Sheldon actually started off with this title, and I was like angry getting into it. I'm like clicked really fast, you know. <laughs> Cards you shouldn't, but don't tell me what to do. And I clicked really fast into this and started reading this article. And then he actually took a step back from his original title, saying like. You know, it is a little bit clickbaity, cards you shouldn't play. Uh, and so instead, it was more like a, a, he reframed it saying that these are cards that I don't play and you might want to consider not playing as well for the health of your play group. You have a quote here. Do you want to read it? Sure, I can read this. So that's kind of the, the general nature of his stuff, but he did have some stuff going on and this has to do with the ban list. The commander ban list is crafted differently than the ban list for all other formats. Those formats want the best possible tournament experience, balance, playability, watchability, and so forth. Commander's created to create the best possible social experience. So while a play style might not resonate with me or the rest of the rules committee, it might be just what you like. We'd like to keep as many of those avenues open to you as possible. It bears repeating that while we on the rules committee have a concept of what makes the best kind of games for the broadest possible audience, we also have the idea that if a group is all on the same page, whatever kind of game that resonates with them is best. So that is a direct quote from the article from Sheldon, just given his thinking, uh, which is basically something that rules committee echoes often, which is we have to do some stuff, but in general, the, f the format can take care of itself a little bit. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that play groups can police themselves with open communication. And some of the things you've talked about on this podcast is how to talk to your play group, how to bridge those gaps in between decks or have these conversations. And I think that uh, that's the right approach. So a lot of what Sheldon says in this passage specifically resonates with me. A uh, part of the thing that doesn't really resonate with me is that, well, if you, if you ban in a different way, or if you control the game in a different way, but you recognize that people play the game differently, how do you ban at all? How do you manage it at all? This is a very old argument because the rules committee has often stated things like Sheldon said, which is that it's way more art than science, that they're not banning things based on data, that they can't actually get the data, uh, Oh, data can be gotten, Josh. <laughs> no. Listen, okay. I don't really want to go down this particular road right here. Ban I think solemn simulacrum <laughs> ban and burnished heart. <laughs> okay, so well, let's let's talk about Sheldon's list first, and maybe we'll, there'll be room for us to discuss some of those some of those things you're talking about. You did not make it off the table. <laughs> Fourth try is a charm. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let's just go down Sheldon's list. So he listed 14 cards. We're not going to read what each card does. We'll we'll discuss sort of they you fit them into broad categories. Yeah. They they he seems to sort of dislike certain types of effects. Mm -hmm. Um so this is what Sheldon listed as the 14 cards that you should not play. That's not how we put it though actually. It's and really just 14 cards he doesn't like. He doesn't like, yeah. That he doesn't put in his decks. And this is the order that he listed it in. I I don't know why it's in 
a particular order or anything. So just it's there. Yeah. It, it, when I read the article, I didn't take it to mean like the first one was the worst one and the last one was the, the least or any. Is it in alphabetical order? No. Uh, no, no, I, no, it is close. Oh, it Look, is. Yeah. And this is the extra. Okay. Alphabetical order. All right. Uh, except for, <laughs> oh yeah, the last one's an extra. That's what was yeah. for me. Okay. Sorry. Here we go. Number one, Armageddon <laughs> destroys all lands. Back to basics. Also destroys a lot of lands. Grand Arbiter Augustine the Fourth. Uh, that's a tax commander, tax commander, makes everybody have to pay more for their spells. Mind Slaver, that steals uh, an opponent's turn. Palancron, that go, just combo -y. Paradox Engine, we all know what that does. Seedborn <laughs> Muse, you should all know what Seedborn Muse does. Soren Markov, that sets a, a, a player's life total to 10. Stasis, that, does, that makes it so people can untap. Static Orb, also makes it so people can untap. Thieves Auction, confusing. <laughs> Winter Orb, that makes it so people can untap lands. Wound Reflection, does a lot of damage. That one's weird. Derevi, um, untappy, gets around uh, commander tax and untap stuff. Yeah. Okay, so that's the list of 14 cards that Sheldon. I'm going to say that Sheldon says you shouldn't play, but that's not actually what he says in his article. He gives a bunch of caveats and he basically says that's 14 cards he doesn't like and doesn't put in his decks yeah and, and it's, probably it's doesn't like, like it if you put it in your decks when you're playing him like he's saying i don't like this in my play group kind of or he feels like his play group is pretty healthy and they don't use these cards right and so if you find that these cards are a sticking point in your play group you might want to exclude them okay so you kind of broke these down into little categories here and then and let's talk about i, I don't know getting into the minutia of each card and arguing with Sheldon, like... Probably not. You yeah. should like this card, because how are you going to convince somebody of that? But it's interesting to see what types of effects he tends to not like. And Is that also, a dare? Can I tell him you should like this card? <laughs> you can. I <laughs> <Okay>. mean... <laughs> uh, and, he, and Sheldon is on the rules committee, so the fact that he doesn't like something is... It's different than DJ not liking something or me not liking something or you out there not liking a particular card, right? Like, that's just the, the reality of it. He's one of only, like, four or five people that actually has a say when they go to be like, what card should we ban? Sheldon's sitting at the table when that happens. I'm not there. DJ's not there. And you uh, you guys, you're not there either. So it there is a little bit to be said for the fact that he is who he is and therefore th these cards... It, it matters that a little more. That scares me. Yeah, we'll talk about that at the end. Yeah. Let's let's go through the um. Let's go through the list here. All so. right. So the first thing that I've noticed is that mana restriction is a huge problem that he has with the cards in Commander. Six of the fourteen cards, like Armageddon, Back to Basis, Grand Arbiter, Stasis, Static uh, Orb, Winter Orb, all of those are mana restriction type cards. They're stacks type cards. I mean, exactly. Armageddon and Back to Basics, maybe not technically, but. Mm -hmm. Definitely, they make it hard to play the game and cast your spells. They 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 attack your lands or the untapping of your lands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's a big part of the cards that he doesn't like to play. Josh, do you play a lot of these cards? No, but I have played a lot of these cards. But I don't I, either, but I have I have played them before too. Yeah. I mean, I've told that great story where somebody played Winter Orb and I just happened to have a tapper uh, on board <laughs> and I could tap his Winter Orb and he didn't even know the errata, which was like, if it says if Winter Orb is untapped, then you can't. Then you can only untap yeah. one land each turn. So I could just tap it only before, uh, only after his turn. So everybody else could untap, but not him. Oh my gosh, I love it. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> uh, but I've definitely played some of them, but I don't play them often. No, I don't. So, so I understand. Do you play, against, not do you play these. against them often? No, but I have for sure. Okay. Yeah. Do you um, think they're a problem in our format? No, not at all. Um, okay. But I am on record as saying, like in general, I'll play at whatever meanness level you want to. That's true. If you want to play, I've been on. I've been kind of that way too, where yeah. it's like, you want to play competitive? Let me go get the right deck. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I might like. I'll give up that one game and be like, okay. And then now we're gonna play though, as if you have Winter Orb in all your decks, which mm -hmm. is totally fine if you want to do that. We, I was playing at Pax with somebody, and it was a fun game. And he was playing the Azuri, the um, the Simic Azuri Claw of Progress. Yes, and it was a fun game. And I was playing my Rune deck. And I had a couple cards in my hand that were kind of mean, and I just wasn't going to play them because it wasn't that kind of game. And he goes, Sage of Hours. And I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> oh, it's getting mean Yeah, now. exactly. So then I'm like, okay, stop that combo, and now I'll go ahead and play all the stuff I wasn't going to play. Because if you're willing to do that, then you got to be willing to take it. That's, That's right. kind of how I feel about these effects. Totally fine. You want to Armageddon? But when I stop you, now I get to be as mean as possible all the time. That's <laughs> that's You made the rules, not me. That's right. <laughs> uh, okay, and I, I kind of feel the same way. And uh, I don't know. It's just doesn't seem to bother me very much and a I lot don't of people a lot. hate that stuff though 
do they see it more often? Like maybe here's the thing. If one person loves these effects and they're just plaguing your play group, then yeah, maybe it does kind of become a problem and a card that like you need to have this discussion of like, look, I want to play magic. Stop destroying all my lands. I haven't cast a dinosaur in weeks, but like in the odd Armageddon once in a while, it, yeah, it doesn't make me mad at all. It's like, okay, yeah, you got me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, it's fine. Uh, um, what's the next category? The next category is combo enablers. I got a quote, Josh. Okay. I got a quote. Is this from Sheldon? This is from Sheldon, yeah. Okay. The card that uh, he put this under was Palancron. It's a good uh, card, though. Yeah, Palancron's a good card. Uh, basically, it's a creature that when it enters the battlefield, you can untap up to seven lands, and you can return it to your hand for four mana. So if you have a mana doubler, you can net one mana every time you play Palancron and bring it back, giving you infinite mana, infinite storm, infinite enter the battlefield effects. Any amount of lands, a few lands that tap for more than one mana, basically go infinite with it because- You need to be able to double because you need to get to eight. True, but you can get a land like with Market Festival or something on it that taps for four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. all of a sudden, like, or Gaia's Cradle and stuff will- Gaia's Cradle's a good yeah, one. Yeah, Cabal Coffers and things like that. Mana doublers, I guess you're counting that, but Sarah yeah. Sanctum, things like that can do it because all you need is it untaps seven lands. If, if the seven lands create- 14 nine mana. Ma I think you, yeah. Uh, four to return, seven to cast. So That's 11, 11, so you need so to get 12. 12 mana out of your seven lands. Not that hard to do, honestly. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is a quote that Sheldon said after Palancron. Anytime I see lands untapping on a card, I get a squiggly feeling in the pit of my stomach because it seems like infinite combos aren't far behind. So what cards on the list are in the combo category, do you think? Uh, I th Palancron, well, it was Palancron because that's what he said it yeah. under. I feel like Paradox Engine is not just a value card. It is part of this. Oh, it's a combo card for it's sure. It's a combo card. And then also Mindslaver because I read Mindslaver in his list as a Mindslaver lock, not a, not a one-off effect. I mean, Recurring there's it. maybe only less than a handful of times I've ever seen a Mindslaver used only once in a game. Whenever somebody plays it, almost always they're recurring it and infinitely playing it or, yeah. Mind and then one of the value? games was against you. <laughs> I only played it once because you, you played it once me. and took my turn and I still won, but I, that's I, very rare. I did have you kill someone else so yeah. I could sneak by and get second place. <laughs> but that's very rare. Usually some mind slaver hits the table. They're taking all your turns, usually. Yeah. Um Okay. Yeah. Does uh does combos make you feel squicky, DJ? Uh, but no. I I don't play combos in a lot of decks, but I like combos. I have a deck where I crammed as many combos in it as possible. I used to play a lot of combos and I play less now. And if you build good decks with good synergy, sometimes you just stumble across them when you're playing. And it's like, well, these four cards, they, I'm not gonna not do it, right? Cause that's just insulting to everybody at the table. But in general, I don't build my decks to try and combo off. I don't like like stormy type combos, ones that like take a long time and a lot of intricacy on the part of the person. And you're basically like sitting there watching them figure it out. That's not my favorite. That gives me a squicky feeling, I guess, from a different, for a different reason. It's not because I'm losing. It's just because, okay, yeah, I know it's Storm. And is it going to work? Like, <laughs> please yeah. tell me I'm dead because don't make me go through all this and then it doesn't work. That would, yeah, that would be miserable. Um, uh, but that has to do more along lines of a play experience. Just a infinite palancron. I have infinite mana. You need something else. It's not too hard to find something else, but that won't just win. You need another piece, right? Yeah, yeah. you do. And uh, it's, I mean... You need to get up to that 12 mana by having something put together to get up there. I feel like that's not a degenerate combo. Like, wouldn't Kiki Jiki just be higher up on the list of degenerate things you can do? Maybe, but it's so specific that, yeah, I don't know. Palancron kind of, you'll see it in a lot of different decks doing its thing and then... But you need, you need Palancron. You either need a bunch of mana. I mean... No, you're going to get a bunch of mana. Well, you need to get up to that right. that amount of mana in your seven lands, and you need a mana doubler, and then you or a mana doubler or something else to generate that extra mana, or and then you need something to go off with it, sort yeah. of that. Kill Sometimes condition. that can just be like a lot of cards, though. It's true. So, yeah. and maybe haste, but maybe not even haste. Like a lot of times, just enough spells will just do it. Mm -hmm. um, Paradox Engine, obviously. Paradox Engine is a funny one, right? Because it is objectively insanely powerful, and probably the most powerful card for our format that's come out at least in the last few years. And yet I have not seen it that much. I've definitely seen it, but people caught on really fast to like, well, this isn't very fun and just haven't played it that much. 
And uh, every once in a while it comes out and you're like, uh oh, and you do lose to it, but it's just not that big a deal because it's not happening a lot. I have a lot. I mean, I don't auto include it in every deck. I have it in an artifact matters deck. Right. But you could put it in a lot of decks probably that you'd haven't just yeah. because, eh, why? Like I've won that way. And then it's like, do I want to keep doing it? I mean, I think I used it on game nights once. and It's not in my Solvala deck and that's all about tapping and, it great and in Solvala. Deck, yeah. yeah. Like it just generates a bunch of mana and it's but not But you're like, yeah, the deck's fine. I don't need it. Yeah. So it's kind of going ar- along with what Sheldon's saying, which is like, he just doesn't like that card and the effect and the but type he, of games. But he that it says causes. that like combos, whenever you're untapping lands, combos aren't far behind. Yeah. So it's not the untapping the lands party has a problem with. It's the following combo. Yeah, maybe. I guess so. Sure. Is it just like a general thing? Like he doesn't like combo? I, maybe he just doesn't like cards that make combo kind of easy, which Paradox Engine does. Palancron also does. Uh, Mind Slaver is a, a weird one. I don't know if I'd even put it in the combo category. Or even though you're right, it does combo. It's not a great play experience in to like one person just stops but it playing. Is a, but it's a combo. Uh, you're right. No. In a multiplayer setting, I agree with that, that you basically shut down the other opponent. But essentially... I mean, if it if it couldn't be recurrable, taking one turn from somebody, totally fine and could be kind of fun and funny for everybody. The fact that you're like, no, you don't get any more turns. That's the part that like... That's, that's the same. In my mind, that's the same as uh, Kiki Jiki Splinter Twin. No. Thing where it's just like, no, you've you've now died. I've True, mind slaver but that locked game's you. over in that one. In the other one, I got to sit there while you do the thing and everybody's got to be like, well, because you can't always just, like sometimes you look at their hand and you're like, well, I can cast three creatures. What's that do? You know what I mean? So you, would, you wouldn't you would concede at sorcery speed or whatever. Well, I mean, we can well, talk about that later. The, but, it depends on how it goes, but yeah. But you wouldn't just like, I've now locked you out of the game. You don't just say like, Good game. Yeah, it's dep- fine game, sir. And I then mean, often you do, but it depends because you're in a multiplayer setting. There might be chances for other players to do stuff, but they might like let you get like see what goes on with your turns before they do it too. I've been in games where they're like, I could stop this, but let's see what he does with your turns here, and now I got to sit there, <laughs> you know. And then the other player goes, okay, fine, X Y Z, you know. It's just it's not the same as Kiki Jiki where you're just like, okay, we're dead. All right, we're dead. There's a little bit of like... There is a little bit of... I feel like there's a little bit of, of play there. In one-on-one, it's definitely like, I'm dead. But but in multiplayer... In multiplayer, there are you, times... So you're the one that does say like, yeah, kill me. It'll be, two against, look, it'll be two against one now. Yeah, kill them, and sometimes kill the you players. look at your hand too and you're like, hmm, I don't know. It's not... You know what I mean? Like, it's not cut and dry. You're not... Let me see what you do first. You know? Yeah, I don't like just like, we had a, a guy in our play group and he did play Armageddon and he basically had this deck where he'd like get a Lumog out and Armageddon you. And I was totally fine with it. But he would like expect everybody to concede. He would like show the Armageddon like, hey, look, you guys want to shuffle up? And I'd be like, no, screw that. Kill us. Because uh, there was a number of times where I'm like, play a land, swords your Ulamog, go. And it's like, okay, I play a land. Okay, I play a land. Okay, I play a land. This is the game you put us in, man. Mm-hmm. There was a game where I went, Meekstone, go. Listen, you don't get to just show the card <laughs> and win the game. You got to win the game. And Mindslaver has a little bit of that play to it, which is annoying, but I'm just not going to concede to you for that. So do you are are you the kind of person that plays an infinite Mindslaver or are you just no, like, no? I've never done it in my life uh, in modern or something, but in in uh, just because I don't find it fun and I don't think it's fun for the other person. Mm-hmm. I'll play an Emrakul because that's one turn. Yeah. I'll take your one turn. And then they get a turn right afterwards. Too. And a lot of times you just go, okay, do some stuff. And it kind of messed you up. And they go, yep. And then they're still in it, you know? So, okay. Moving on to the next thing. So, so just to sum that up. Yeah. Uh, Palancron. I don't like the idea that like the combo aspect is fine. We bring up, you bring up the other idea of, of basically that mind slaver is a little bit different than the other ones because it's not, it's, it has to do with the multiplayer aspect of it, that you essentially have a combo that can only target one person or that only that doesn't really work for that one person or something like that. And I want to be clear. I'm not saying don't do the mind slaver lock. Don't play Palancron. Don't play paradox engine. I just don't, but it's totally fine. Like you I said, play Palancron, not really. I have play. I mean, maybe I have like a deck in it. I like Palancron. Yeah, it's great. It's great. It feels to, like Paradox Engine to me, though. Once I I did it a couple times, I was like, yeah, and I could do that. But eh, it's just I don't. I'm not see. I don't see what the distinction is between these combos and uh, yeah. Mike and Trike, or yeah, sure. uh, just basically the card Tooth and Nail. Are all of them in the same category for you, or are all of them bad? Are 
all of them. I don't think any of them are bad. Or... That's that's what I'm saying. Sorry, that was a bad. Yeah, that was a bad. It's word. the Sage of Hours thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're playing that game. Totally fine. Totally fine. I'm totally fine. That's the game we're playing. That's cool. If you're if you're gonna tooth and nail for the win, totally fine. I'm. It doesn't make me mad at all. You don't also get to get mad at me now when I play mean though. That's all I'm saying. Do you like playing mean every so often? Yeah, I love it. Okay. But so, I just don't so, get to that much because, and I love playing <laughs> for fun too. Like I'm happy, whatever. You tell me which one you want to do and I'm going to be happy to do either. So but, you don't get a squeaky feeling. Nah. You get a, you get a, all right, we want to make sure our decks are balanced. And if you've got, you know, the I win in there, I want to make sure that I got that too. So we can actually play. I know I play with you and you're the same way. I don't, you don't combo off when it's not that type of game at all. Oh yeah. No, if it. If I feel if I feel like the tone of the game is a little bit different, like I just won't combo off. Like I'll and you or, don't pull out your mean deck first. No. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, okay. and I think Sheldon. I don't know. I don't know if he has mean decks or whatever. If he how he feels about that other part. You know, we're reading a lot into his article, so I don't want to like equate. I don't want to pretend we're saying Sheldon's saying exactly this because we don't know. He gets a squeak, he gets a squeaky feeling in the pit of his stomach because it seems like infinite combos aren't far behind. So it feels like he doesn't like him in their combos. I think it, I'm reading it just like that. That he's like, nope, infinite combos. <laughs> Squeak. That's that's the hate, sound of squeaking. I mean, okay. Uh, okay. This next one's pretty funny. Yeah. I actually, I actually kind of agree with this. Uh, frustrating to resolve. So that's I the next category of cards. <laughs> yeah. There's really only one card. There's out only of one card in this that's Thieves Auction. And that's the one I was like, what? I don't understand why it's... It doesn't fit with the other stuff, but then I realize, like, yeah, it's just annoying to play with. Thieves Auction is frustrating to resolve. Do you want me to just, you don't have to look it up. I can just explain it. Basically, everyone takes all their stuff and throws it in the middle, and it's almost like a draft, like you're picking dodgeball teams. You go around and you pick something, and everyone picks something. Yeah, it's and you like end you up go, with all, you go, you go, you go. All sorts then... of other people's stuff. It is it is frustrating to resolve and annoying to figure out where your stuff is afterwards. Uh, I was going to read the exact wording, because the wording makes it a little confusing, too. But It does, yeah. Yeah, it's... It just takes a long time, and <laughs> but at the end of it, like everyone's just like, okay, we shuffled around some permanents. Yeah, and it feels like well, nobody has any plan. It's just like what do we end up with, and yeah, <laughs> and and someone at the table is like, it's chaos, guys. Yeah, <laughs> um, I actually have a card that's way more powerful than this, but I don't play because it is annoying to resolve, and that's Lim Duel's Vault. Yeah. So you look at the top five cards, you can rearrange them in any way, or you can pay a life and put those to the bottom. And look at the next And look top at the five. next five cards. So you can't just find what you want and and put it on top of your deck. It sounds worse than a tutor, but in some ways it can be better because you're looking at five cards. So you can kind of find a, a grouping of five that has two or three cards that you really like. Exactly. And pay five life, get 25 cards deep into your deck and find the best grouping that you want and then arrange those exactly how you want it. It's... It's a very powerful card. CEDH, you'll see it quite a bit. The 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 problem is just the amount of time that it takes. And you have to do, you, there's no shortcutting it. And because you can get like a hand, or, or sorry, I'm calling it a hand, uh, a, a grouping of five cards that's like, it's pretty good, but I could maybe do better. There's a lot of thinking involved where people just stare at the five cards and like stare off into the air and they go in that beautiful mind mode for like a long time. And then they go, okay, I'm going to put it on the bottom. And then I'm gonna pay a life. choose it. And then they go again. And then you got to order the cards once you choose it. It usually takes, you can count on like five minutes if somebody counts, <laughs> which is a long time. It's just, there's just, no fast yeah. way to do it. Like <laughs> we, we talk, we all play top Yeah. and we play top responsibly. I yeah. think I don't feel like you slow top down at all. Uh, I feel like you're not bothered when I play a top. It's just like top, you know, nothing. This one, you kind of have to wait and you kind of have to go through all of the motions and it's annoying. <laughs> Uh, his next category, or you you put these into categories. He yeah, didn't. I, yeah, is, um, yeah, I'd like to have you a question mark. It's too much damage too quickly. So there's two cards, Soren Markov and Wound Reflection, that are on the list. These two are a little bit head scratchers for me because I don't think they're real big problems at all. Yeah. Again, Soren Markov is the Planeswalker that sets an opponent's life total to 10. So it just deals 30 damage or more if they are playing Alora or something. And Wound, Wound Reflection is an enchantment that says at the end of each turn, uh, your opponents take damage equal to the amount of damage they took that turn so if you attack them for 10 and then pass the turn on the end step they're going to take 10 more from wound reflection your it's really wounds, good your wounds are like reflected back on you it's like oh i've been stabbed oh, i've been stabbed twice it's really good in vile smasher 
Do you know what's really good? I think that Sheldon one time had wound reflection out and someone Soren Markov him down to 10. And then at the end of the Take turn, another 30. he lost another 30. <laughs> he just auto lost to it and was like, I hate those cards. <laughs> Banned. Um, yeah, I don't know. I Wound reflection is like not even on my radar as a card that I... I love Wound Reflection. I think it's fun. I just mean not on my radar as a card I'm worried about in any way. It's great. Yeah, it's totally fine. It's, it's like super fair. Yeah. Yeah, I don't... That one I don't get. Soren Markov is a card that people have complained about for years. It kind of... It's like Sarah Ascendant. Mm -hmm. How it feels like it breaks the rules of the format in a weird way. Even though... Because... In a 20 life game, it's setting your life total in half. Mm -hmm. In ours, it's taking 75% of your life total away. So it feels like it's like unbalanced. It's powerful. Is that, do you see it in, I mean, if we're limiting things on power level, like does it, do you see it often? Is it in our most competitive decks? No. It's not. No. And, and it's not even that powerful, honestly. It's, it reads more powerful than so, it is. So obviously it's not for power reasons per se is it the feel bad reasons like people don't like it so don't play it sure i don't know i think there's a lot of cards that feel bad yeah i don't know i yeah this that card is just not a problem to me i've been hit by it many times i'm like okay i'm at tons 10. of times i'm not dead yet and i've won games where they, people have put me to 10 so oh, yeah yeah okay um and then the last two you put under a category you called too much value and you put derevi and seedborn muse here now everybody knew Oh my god, Lord! What I don't think what I've happened? ever screwed up that badly throwing a paper. It made it and off I the screw table. All the time. It made it off the table. <laughs> <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> the only goal is to throw it. I no. My goal is to get it to do cool floats and flippies. Well, that was a cool float and flippy. Yeah. Okay, so Seaborn Muse. Different people can play the throw off the paper game in different ways. Josh. Sure, sure. Every way to play the game. Ways is... you shouldn't throw the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Any way that makes it so it stays on the table at the end of it. Uh, okay, so Seedborn Muse. Let's talk about this one really quick. I mean, it's super powerful. It's. I put it in a lot of decks. It. Yeah, it's half of profit of Crufix. Yeah. Ish. I don't know. It seems totally fair again because. You need another piece to make it really good. So many of these are, I feel like when you play something and you can't answer it, that's the part that feels bad. And so many of these are seven mana, five mana, six mana. It's like, don't you, don't you have answers at this point in time? Like, aren't we having an interactive game where like you can kill a Seedborn Muse? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely won games where other people had Seaborn Muses, too. It's not so... I, there's definitely been games they play it, untap on somebody's turn, and they just don't have enough instant speed stuff to really take that much advantage of it. And then they get they get it for a couple turns, but that doesn't win them the game. Now, there are games where they've got Valken Ori, they've got some kind of Mana Sync type stuff, and they run away with it. So it gives them a ton of mana and and whatever other cool stuff they have on the battlefield. Unlike Palancron or they something. they need other things. It gives you mana at an awkward time too, right? It gives it to you only on your opponent's turns, that extra mana. And that can be great, but it's not always great. So you need a lot of cards. You need a synergy to make it work. And to me, that's fine. You that's can just, build synergistic decks that do crazy awesome things. That's, that's just, just what we call a card in Commander, right? Like, hey, it does synergistic things. <laughs> Isn't that what you want your deck to do? I mean, undoubtedly very powerful. I know many cards that just win the game like from this stage, you know what I mean? Like five mana and then you need other stuff to do. Well, guess what? Five mana and other stuff to do can just win the game. Okay. So, so generating value doesn't, doesn't seem to be something that offends me. So do you want to talk about Derevi? I also don't have a problem with Derevi. It, it used to be a very powerful commander. Um, it's powerful. Yeah. Because it, it has an activated ability. You can activate from the command zone that puts it into play. And when it comes into play, it will, tap or untap something right and because the activated ability has like a static cost that doesn't interact with commander tax and so derevi just kind of always can come out is four mana mm -hmm. and so there's some interesting things you can do and because it's a twiddle on a stick you can combo a little bit with it also it's pretty good at just like coming out and chump blocking over and over at certain points in the game because there's nothing people can do. And I've had games when I used to have my Derevi deck, took it apart a while ago, but where it's like, oh, I attack you, Josh. Okay. I bring Derevi and I block. 
back to the command zone. Next person, I attack you, Joss. Yep, bring Derevi back out, block. Because it's just like turn 12 and I got 15 mana. Yeah, or, or you know, I bring it out and block and, oh, you're probably going to attack me next turn. I'll or tap, tap that, that thing. down or, yeah. you know, whatever, something Before like that. Before combat, yeah. I'll, ta- I'll yeah, bring it tap out, tap that tap down, thing. this thing's there to block and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's good. And uh, also when you have a team of little guys that come in and, and do stuff, you can kind of untap your lands. But, I mean... Sort of Feast and Famine is a powerful effect that kind of untaps all your lands. It does untap other things. Seaborn Muse is that same kind of untappy. Well, he to be fair, he put the same two I things know. on the list. So he Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like so is this just another reiteration of the argument of Seedborn Muse? I don't find a problem with it. I mean, the list is Sheldon's cards, right? And we're gonna yeah. talk about in a second some cards we don't like, and some of our cards aren't on his list, and that's totally fine, right? Everyone's gonna have their cards. I actually had trouble coming up with a list because I don't have a lot of cards I don't like, but we had to for the episode. Mm-hmm. But everybody has certain cards they don't but it's like, maybe or whatever. You don't like, but you just don't play. You're like, this isn't this isn't what makes the play experience good for me. Yeah, and in the end, that's what Sheldon ended up saying. It's like this isn't a good play experience for me, uh, and so that was, that's misleading when you hear the cards you shouldn't play. That's true. That's what I wanted to say. What do we think about the whole idea of like a list of cards? that you're telling other people they shouldn't play, even though that's not exactly what Sheldon was doing. But I don't think that's what we're about to do either. No. We're commenting on why we don't play cards or do, but that doesn't matter. It matters what you want to do, what you find fun. But it is sort of, there's this weird feedback loop. It's weird because of where it comes from, right? Well, no, I was going to say, there's a weird feedback loop where like some of your fun is predicated on other people having fun, whether you like Uh, it or not. Especially if you're in a play group. If you played an LGS or something, maybe not as much. But if if you <laughs> jo- if you're a stranger, Josh doesn't care if you have fun. He just wants to crush you. No, that I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say for other people though, it's less of a, a factor than if you're playing with like your close friends and like also like you want to get invited back and oh yeah, things like that. That's just the reality of how the world works, right? So on some level. I might be fine with Armageddon. I don't put it in a bunch of decks because people don't tend to like to play against it. And like, I want people I'm playing with to have fun too because I want to have Commander Knights and play Commander. And if they're like, Commander sucks because it's no fun, we won't do it. I can't play my spells. I want to play spells. Yeah. Yeah. We just talked about my favorite deck and it's one that lets people play magic. It kind of facilitates playing uh, even more so than a normal Commander deck. Yeah. So what do you think about this whole idea of listing cards that other people quote unquote shouldn't play i mean are we using it as a platform just to sort of suggest to people like hey think about this type of stuff i think that that when you get into the depths of sheldon's article yeah that's what he's trying to do yeah he's like think about these things and that's good i think that's positive to to be very critical of the cards you're playing in your deck and what you're introducing to your play group that's something that everyone should should pay attention to. Uh, the idea of cards you shouldn't play, oh man, it just drives me crazy because it's like, we, do you know me? Like, do you know that like I'm playing this wrong or that I'm pub stomping like people with pre-cons? Like, do you know my play group? Do you know the way that we do things? Like, why are you assuming that you can tell me how to play this game? I see a lot of that out there online and it honestly... It's, it's, you wouldn't think it would be this way, but it's usually casuals towards the competitive crowd. The competitive crowd, by and large, usually understands what the casuals are doing and they just don't want to do it, but they don't make fun of them or ridicule them for it. But I do see a lot of casuals that ridicule the competitive EDH people. Yeah. And, and, and try and shame them or whatever. And, you know, that's kind of a similar thing, right? Like, I don't like that. We've always said on the show, I don't want to ever tell you what cards to play. I I don't ever want to tell you what you find fun. Do you know what that's that's kind of happened to me before? Uh, story time. Like I have some really janky decks. Like you know this. Like I have some decks that try to do Rube Goldberg machines, right. like crazy stuff. And sometimes to pull off crazy stuff, I need tutors to put it together. Right. And I feel like my deck is not very powerful. And so the tutors are just there to bring it up to the baseline. Right. <laughs> just there to bring it up to like, can this actually perform? And I've played tutors before and they're like, oh, you're the kind of person that plays demonic tutor. And it's, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it, it's like, they're shaming me for the card that I'm playing. And I'm like, no, you don't get it. Like, what? come on. Like, what do you? It's a hard thing, right? That's the biggest, one of the biggest hurdles for our format is just that level of communication, everybody being, you know, 
I don't know, being an adult about it and having open communication and everybody feeling like everything's on the up and up and nobody like sort of needling each other, but trying to act just like mature people and be like, okay, you know, maybe your deck is a little strong. Maybe mine was too strong. I've definitely said that after games. I'm like, uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I thought my deck was probably, my deck's probably too strong. It, w- it probably wasn't the right pick. I'm really sorry. Yeah. I'm going to tone it down now. You know, I'll do my best here. And I've had people do that before games yeah. start. It was in Vegas. Narset guy says, I only brought Narset because I was at the commander uh, big event thing. And um, it's good. And we're like, sit on down. We'll target you. And he's like, great. Yeah. And, and he won very quickly. But everybody knew what was going to happen in and that game. What was possible? No one was angry. Yeah. Everyone was like, you did the Narset thing. Good for you. And he's like, yep, I just wanted to play cool and then that was it like we just chilled and kept playing and it was fine for our new show extra turns which if you haven't checked it checked it checked it out this is just good english if you haven't seen it it's a uh, sort of our our sort of new take on commander gameplay it's it's a spin-off of game nights we're hoping it'll be a little bit simpler to produce uh, if we keep doing it so the funny thing about that game and i won't spoil how it ends but it was when wedge and the professor were here for we shot a couple of game nights episodes with them a long time ago, a number of months ago. And one of the games, the Shadowborn Apostle game, that shoot went really fast. That game went pretty fast. And they'd already, it was our second day and they knew the process and Wedge and the professor got through their interviews super fast. And Jimmy and I were like, we can shoot our interviews tomorrow. What if we shot a game with no interviews for this show concept we have? I didn't even have the name Extra Turns then. And we, okay, let's, let's play another game. And Wedge and the professor only had the decks they had brought which were the Sig River Guide deck and the Ruhan of the Fomori deck. And so they were going to play the same decks. And Jimmy and I were like, well, we don't want to play the same decks because it'll be weird. We already did that show. Mm-hmm. But we weren't planning on doing this at the start of the day. So we like looked around and I was like, the only deck I had was my Vile Smasher Thrasios deck and Jimmy had his Gishoth deck. And I was like, guys, the Vile Smasher deck is it's pretty strong. It's stronger than the other decks here. And they're like, that's okay. We know that. You know, Let's just play the game. And as long as everybody knows, nobody gets mad about that kind of stuff. And Whereas, hopefully the playgroup can correct for it too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, and you'll you'll see that game is very, very close, even though my deck is stronger than theirs. Because going into the game, they know and they can correct for that. And, you know, the game's actually pretty sweet. Okay, so... Watch extra turns. This is... you. you we have written down here, but Sheldon is on the rules committee. This is a worry that you had, and a lot of people expressed this... Uh, when the article came out, which was this idea that like, listen, and we talked about it earlier, if I say I don't like a card or you say you don't like a card or any random person does, it means one thing. But if Sheldon says it, it means something else because he is sitting at the table when they decide what gets banned. When you're in a position of power, like do you, do you sort of share your opinions so openly about it? And like, it makes me very worried about his his mindset and how he's approaching rules and how he's approaching commander. Are you worried he's going to ban wound reflection? No, because uh, the other, there are sensible people on the rules committee. He'll be, he'll be shouted down because no reasonable person will ban wound reflection. Uh, what about Palancron? He shouldn't, but, but a reasonable person could get closer to banning Palancron than wound reflection, right? See, that's why I'm worried. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm pointing out your... I mean, I'm helping you with your point here. Yeah. Like, when one quarter or 20% or whatever, because it's fluctuated, right? It's been four. Sometimes it's four, it's sometimes it's five. Big. I don't think it's ever been six, but maybe. It's I, not a big group. Yeah. When a sizable portion is like, these are the cards I don't like, like, all it needs is one other ridiculous person to change their mind, and then suddenly it's changed my format. Ridiculous person? I shouldn't <laughs> include ad hominem attacks. <laughs> <laughs> Some person that is that has this, I don't know. I don't know what it is, what this... This was the part, and, and you got worked up about when we were talking about it before. Like, it, I think if this article had been written by almost anybody else, besides Toby Elliott or one of the other people that's on the Rules Committee, yeah. you wouldn't have probably gotten as worked up. But it worries you because he does have a say. Yeah. And it's funny because I've been he on He has this a say, and it means enough to him that he puts an article out there. Well, I mean, Sheldon writes articles about Commander... He gets paid to do it. He has to write an article about Commander sometimes. Yeah. He has to come up with a topic. It's like us and a show topic. It doesn't always mean that like, oh, this is the best topic that I've ever thought of in my life. It means this week we got to talk about something. And this could have been a topic like this. 
I have been on the show many times and I have been occasionally critical of the rules committee and of Sheldon. But I want to say that like I actually have a lot more trust in them maybe than I used to. And it might just be because I've been around for a long time now. It might also be because I've met a bunch of them now. It also, I think their track record is actually pretty good. Not that I've agreed with 100% everything they've done, but I mean the track record of being pretty hands-off. They've shown a lot of restraint. They've shown, I used to, when I first started playing Commander, worry that they were tinkerers and they were going to always be messing with it. They haven't really done that. The fact that Paradox Engine isn't banned, I think is a big sigh of relief for me. But I'm wondering if it's the other three and Sheldon is the one saying ban it. No, I don't I don't believe that. I don't know. But having spoken to Sheldon before and met the guy, I feel like he's a reasonable guy. He's a smart guy. He has thoughts about the format from a personal perspective, but he doesn't allow that to cloud his judgment about the format as a whole. They know they created something special. They know that it's bigger than them. These are all my feelings, right? This is not, I don't have like, I haven't actually had that same conversation with Sheldon, but you can look at their track record and they are they are pretty loath to ban things. They, they do it, but they haven't done it a lot. They don't change a ton of stuff. They're not knee jerk. They, I, by, they, I love it every time they don't do something. Yeah. What does that say about a group? But they don't do something a lot and that's rare. That's tr they don't do something all the time. When they do things, I don't agree with a lot of their logic and their explanation. I don't agree with their process. I don't agree with how limited everything is. But there's not a great alternative to some of that stuff in some respect. But do let's, you, let's do you trust the rules committee more than Watsi? <sighs> I think there's, I don't know. It's a tough question to answer because I think there's pros and cons to both. Watsi has to listen to us more. Because the rules committee can just do what they want and they don't really care if commander product doesn't sell or magic cards don't sell. And so our ability to affect the rules committee is in some ways less than Watsi's. Because if I'm mad at Watsi and enough of us are, we can just stop buying cards and they'll get that message and maybe backtrack or do something about it. We don't have that leverage against the rules committee. On the other hand, Watsi is motivated by something the rules committee is not, which is sales and numbers and a bunch of, you know, p widget counters and some corporate accounting people at Hasbro. <laughs> and that's scary too. That's not great You're either. Right. And so that's I don't- predi That's predictable though. It can be, maybe not. What if they go on hard times for some reason that's not related to Commander? Mm -hmm. That's something that's out of our control, but then they look over and they go, well, Commander people could help us solve that problem if we just did X, Y, Z, created a couple cards that were way too powerful to sell some stuff or whatever. That is not necessarily predictable. It's not because of something that happened here. It's because of something that happened over here. They're a big company. So you think that the rules committee could be a good checks and balances on? I'm saying it's not cut and dry. It's not easy. You can't just say yes or no. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying if you look at the rules committee, let's look at their track record, right? Mulligan rule. I'm looking at their track record Mulligan from the rule. very beginning. Uh, okay. Mulligan rule. Uh, positive. Change to rule whatever number that allowed the creation of mana positive. outside that your color a silly identity. Thing okay. To begin with. Profit of crew fix ban. Fine. Fine. Tuck rule. Fine. Not I'm that's not like the last four years. And you can point to stuff that happened before that, but they were in their youth then. I mean, when you make mistakes in your youth, you you fix them. And they did some of that. They used to have banned as commander. That's true. So what do you think about switching to only just banned or not banned? I actually I actually think that makes it simpler for people. Our our format needs to expand to more people. So banned as commander versus just banned is totally fine. Now we can look at the ban list and you can quibble because you can say biorhythm, which I know you're gonna say. Which I'm gonna and say. And I totally agree with. It's a, it's a, it's perplexing. It, does, it makes no sense. Bi biorhythm, there's no way it should be banned. But, but when you, when you, like, are you like, not oh. in charge of that many things. And when biorhythm is just sitting there on the banned list, like what is going, what's going on in their mental process? I think it's let's do less and taking something off the ban list is doing stuff. But they did Protean Hulk off the ban yeah, yeah, list. Yeah. I mean, I believe I have no knowledge. I have no insider knowledge. Okay. Right? I don't know this for speculation. a fact. This is speculation, but it makes sense to me. That was a Watsi request. That card came out in M25. So Watsi, okay, speculation. Yeah. But then if Watsi has that kind of power, 
does the it's rules committee a, actually serve their purpose if they fold to to Watsi's? That's not how request. the world works, and we all know it. It's yeah. not like all or nothing. That's just not how things happen. They've probably requested them a million things. Uh, you know, maybe not a million, but they probably have requested them many, many things. And the rules committee is probably like, no, 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 no. Guys, hey, guess what? We can't say no forever. They're wizards of the coast. I hate that we there's have no to play transparency ball. that we have to guess. We have to play ball with them sometimes because they make the game. And if they want to grab commander from us, they probably can. And so we have to play nice sometimes. They that could. is the way. If anybody who's been involved in politics or business in any way knows that's the way the world works. And so I could easily see them going like, let's do this. Let's Protein Hook's not that bad. Let's unban it. That'll make them happy. We've played ball. And then the next time they come to us with something we really don't want to do, we don't feel that pressure because we just did something for you. Listen, this is all speculation, but this is just the way that being a, an adult human being that's running an important thing works. Like, you got to... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I, I, I don't know. Protein hole coming off is not that bad. No, I don't think it's that bad either. So you and I like, both agree with we've that. We've named six or seven things and, and they've all been, eh, it's pretty good. But it's it's the, it's the not understanding how they do I'm stuff. I sitting here defending the rules committee. Okay, keep going. It's how, it's the reason why is because I don't understand what's going on. Yeah. There seems to be no transparency. Yeah. Uh, and some of their decisions don't seem to be based in actual logic or argument that can be followed. Which ones? That why is bio rhythm on the ban list? Okay, what other ones? Do we need? Do you need more numbers? If you say a bunch of really normal things and then you spout crazy at me, I'm gonna take into cons I'm gonna distrust you in all sorts of other ways. So even though I could pick other things that I don't like, why is there even? They are not in charge of very many things. Why is there even one thing that isn't the way it's supposed to be? I just think it's pretty unrealistic to ask for a ruling body of something this big to not have done some things that you disagree with. No, I mean, yeah. But if they're nine for 10 or eight for 10, that's but pretty good. But a lot of it's times- pretty good. That's better than we're likely to hope for from most equivalent things. I mean, I, I'm, I live in the real world as well. So I can say, you know what? Every- Everything's fine. I'm going to tiptoe around this issue and not deal with it anymore. You know, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with just saying, all right, everything's fine. But, and most of the time I don't think of the ban list. I don't get upset about this kind of stuff. But when we see something like this and I see into the mindset of the people and, and hear stuff like you shouldn't play this, that brings up these feelings of, well, what else shouldn't I do? And when someone has the power to do it, you take notice. Yeah, I guess so. I wouldn't be worried. And part of it is because of the list itself, which all those cards have existed for a long time with the with the exception of Paradox Engine. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're new and he hasn't seen it. If he wanted... It's no, not I like, don't think any of these are getting... I don't think any yeah. of these are in danger of getting... That's damaged. what I mean. And so that whole article to me can be taken with a grain of salt as far as like, I feel like it was probably much more along the lines of, I got to write an article about something. Yeah, I'll write about some cards I don't really like. And then let's put a clickbaity title on it. Yeah, because, you know... Just like everybody else, Sheldon wants to keep writing articles and get paid to do it. People got to read the articles. I mean, we should be able to at least sympathize with that because we got to do totally, the similar yeah, thing no, for podcasts. I totally right? agree. We, we, yeah. we, like it's a thing. I put a clickbaity title on a, on a video and I get way more views. And then people are like, this is clickbait. And I'm like, I don't care. No. <laughs> people noticed it was funny. We did, uh, I think it was around when Commander 2017 came out. Jimmy got on this kick of like, let's try out some clickbaity titles and just see how things go how it affects it he was like in a scientific frame of mind and wanted to test it out and people even noticed in the comments like what's with all the clickbaity titles did you your know? numbers go up <laughs> uh, definitely it works <laughs> that's the thing about it the views work i don't think the, there's a reason why buzzfeed is a thing right yeah yeah the, the view count works but again if you're looking for duration of view of how long people are watching your stuff or consuming it that it doesn't help you it can hurt you in that you people will start to click and be like that's not what this is actually about i'm not i'm going away now where YouTube kind of has moved in favor of people of uh, videos that people watch for a long time. That's true. And so Josh yeah. is like, the commercials come at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> All I need is clicks. Okay, yeah. so uh, this is the part that maybe some of you have been waiting for. Where we're going to talk about some cards we don't play. Again, I want to emphasize, I don't care if you play these cards. I'm not trying to tell you not to play them. I don't play them. Because I don't find it fun when I play them. But I don't, I really don't mind that much. There's a couple cards on here where if you played it all the time, I might be like, I might not want to play with you. And they're not powerful cards. Yeah. They're annoying. Uh, and <laughs> but, notice how we titled this section, cards we don't play, not cards you shouldn't play. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, 
Well, let's start with your number one because it's also on my list. Okay. My number one is Iona Shield of Amira. Amiria. Yeah. So Iona is a big white flying angel that you target a player and that pl- player. Just you pick a color. Oh, sorry. You pick a color and people can't cast spells of that color. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry. I, I feel just, like you target a player because usually you go, well, who is a monocolor <laughs> deck? Let's just shut that deck off. You really do shut off, shut off a player like it is really targeted. And a lot of times the monocolor deck is at a disadvantage. And we then know you, it is from the data. Yeah. And you just shut it down. It's like, yeah, you can't play magic. I don't know. It feels like you're going after the little guy rather than going after what you should be going after. And I don't like that feeling. I uh, have a funny story. So I was at a GP and there, this thing happens at GPs, probably happens to you too now where I'll go to the commander area, I'll start playing a game, but then this line starts to form because people want to play games against me. They want to beat me mostly to tell their friends that they beat that game nights guy and he's not that good. (laughs) But the, so people start, who's next, who's next? And I get this sort of line that forms in my head of like, okay, these three people were next. Mm-hmm. And then, but I can, and then I start warning people like, oh, I'm only gonna be here for two more hours. So you guys might not get in a game with me. So I don't know if you want to wait. So there's this guy and he had been waiting for like a couple hours, just standing around the table, watching play to play. We get into the game and I've got like my mono green Titania deck at the time. And a couple other players are in it. And on like turn five, he, I own us naming green. And I'm like, okay. I mean, you win. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scoop up my cards now, and I'm gonna go play with those three guys that are waiting. Was it worth your two hours, though? But Josh, there's a chance. <laughs> Shouldn't you stay in that game because there's a chance that you can win? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's the same thing with Mindslayer, where you yeah. gotta sit there and watch him. Do you just sit yeah. there and watch him? I'm yeah. talking about in a play group, right? If somebody Mindslayer yeah. locks me at a GP and there's 20 people waiting to play with me, I'm gone. You're, you're okay. Man, yeah, you're cool. yeah. It's a totally different. <laughs> it's a different situation because. You're right. Yeah, but I just always thought that was funny because I'm like, dude, waited two hours so he could Iona me on turn five. Uh, sure. He did, did kind of destroy it, Josh. Yeah, no, no, I got, I got wrecked. I got totally wrecked. He kicked my butt. That's totally fine. Like, I just, yeah, I don't. But I don't like it because, like, you, well, I don't he didn't be, need to wreck you in that way. Like, get wrecked in a different way rather than just saying, like, okay, like, you just happened to bring this deck to the table and you got shut off. And it's totally fine, but I don't like to be him playing the Iona. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, I wasn't really mad about it. I thought it was funny and I just went and played another game, right? I'm a GP. Like, it doesn't matter. I pick up my cards yeah. and I'm in a game two seconds later. But I don't, it doesn't, like, it's it leaves this bad taste in my mouth when I play it because it's like, what did I do there? Like, that's just, I don't know. That's just not, it, I, I just don't find satisfaction. If there it. was a card, yeah. if there was a card that cost eight mana and said, I win the game, would you play it? No, not at all. I wouldn't play it either. Yeah. Okay, there we go. You don't play <laughs> Lab Maniac then? It costs way less than eight mana. Shots fired. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'll do my number two. Or I don't know. I didn't. Do you want put me to these, go again? I didn't put any, these in any particular order. So I didn't either. Okay, go ahead. You crossed one out. Yeah, I was. It felt very similar to Iona, but this is. A, I've been I, thinking it's about not this. Similar. Just like you can't play the game because you brought a particular style of deck. It was Gaddic Teague. Where it's like, the, what you, style of deck is it that spells. has no huh spells? They like got a lot I, of like brainstorms like if and ponders and all kinds of small stuff. No, like if I got a no, you can't. Oh, uh, four four. Yeah, yeah you can't play them. They can play turns of like chaos that. warp your Gaddic to go go about my business. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> then and it's non creature, so big creatures can still be. Played. I know, and I like that. Like yeah. like oh okay, it's like I play creature decks, and it's just this incidental hate against some decks. Yeah, some decks like just have a really big pro- it problem have a with piece of their deck, but they can get out of it. Yeah, which is why I'm like. I, but what I said is like, it's, it's the same talking points as Iona, just okay, not sure. as good. Sure, 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 sure. So let me talk about my real second choice, Yeah. Uh, which is Death Cloud, which is a very fun card, by the way. Why don't you explain it really quickly? Death Cloud is X black, black, black. Uh, <laughs> Destroy everything. <laughs> uh, and for X, everyone, let's see if I can get them all. Um, they sacri- loses X life, yep. sacrifices X lands, yep. Sacrifices X creatures yep. and discards X cards. Uh, the discard is really what puts it over the top because it's just like what it ends up having most of the time is like is everyone. X is how many extra turns of the game you have to go because of this card. Well, if they're good, they did it with Planeswalkers or something out. But if they're not, yeah. then it's just like, oh, so we're starting over now. Okay. But with zero cards. So top deck. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the difference between Death Cloud and like Cataclysm or right. a lot of these other mana thing effects is that I would be okay with it if it wasn't for the discard. Yeah. The fact that you're starting off empty handed, down on lands, no boards. And it does feel weird when it's like, I, I scoop, 
But I, it's hard to scoop because nobody else has scoop. anything. But it's like, uh, do I really want to play this game where it's like a uh, top deck, not a land? I think go. if they got a lot of planeswalkers, like a three planeswalkers, it's totally pretty fine. easy to go like, great job. But like the idea that everything has been set back, because it's not just lands that are wiped away and you have some cards in your hand, it's like everything has been wiped away and everyone's in top deck mode with little resources. And that's not even starting over the commander game where you have seven cards. That's like starting from a weird place that takes way too long. Okay, my number two is chaos stuff. Not all chaos stuff, but certain ones like confusion in the ranks, scramble verse, thieves auction, knowledge pools kind of similar. Listen, if you've got a reason and there's some kind of synergy going on where it looks like, yep, it chaos is all you guys, but not me, totally fine. But there's definitely been games in, and I, I won't call out by name, but there's people, a person in our play group who just played confusion in the ranks for fun and just sat nothing didn't have any way to take advantage of it <laughs> or anything nor in the wary or anything like that nope and so it was just like <laughs> yep this is this game's just gonna take forever because nothing <laughs> anybody does is gonna do what they wanted to and like everyone was just miserable those people that want to watch the world burn yeah that is like <laughs> i just listen go ahead and win i own a me so that i can scoop or whatever but man if you're just gonna make the game just literally everyone's like okay i cast this what's in there okay I got, I'll I'll take that from you then or whatever it is like ugh. So it's only it's only chaos stuff that that affects the gameplay affects the rules in that way. So like gamble, you like gamble, you like chaos warp, you like coin flippy stuff is totally fine. Okay, yeah. It's the ones where it's like everything anybody's going to try and do, it doesn't do that. It does something random or something else and there's no way to like uh that the person who played this spell really has to make that be an advantage for them. Mm -hmm. If you play it as an advantage where it's like, I'm screwing up everybody else's plans in a really weird way. And for me, I'm totally fine. Then that's cool because you're probably going to win or at least maybe I get out from it. But if it's just like, I'm going to play this thing and it's really just going to grind the game to a halt for like five or six turns. That's not my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they should be banned and go ahead and play them. And I even built a chaos deck and this is where I learned it because I was doing it and I didn't like it. <laughs> I was like, Oh, this is gonna be awesome. My whole deck's gonna be about chaos. Then I just realized that just creates four hour long games. That's no fun. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, your third one is a jerk card for jerks, according to a friend of mine. <laughs> My last card, jerk card for jerks, is Vornaclex. Vornclex. Vornclex is a Praetor, the green Praetor, and it doubles your mana. And when your opponents tap their mana, it doesn't untap near during their next untap step. And little known fact about Vornclex is that even if Vornclex dies, if you've mana was tapped while it was around, it still doesn't untap during your next untap step. Yeah, it becomes way more obvious in, on Mitko on Magic Online because there's like this little effect that goes on your lands. is like, nope, that's not untapping. Here's what you got to do if you have a removal spell, by the way. In uh, response to Vornclex being cast before it's entered the battlefield, while it's on the stack, float the mana, let mm -hmm. them land, and then use your Swords of Plowshares, Path to Exile, whatever, so that your lands will untap. If you don't happen to have untapped mana, though, or a removal spell at hand... You have, like, a board wipe or something uh, like that. Ouch. Even the board wipe is probably sorcery speed, and, like, half your lands aren't going to untap. Yeah. Which sucks. I mean, that's that's actually the part that I really don't like about it. The mana doubling is fine. Like, Regal Behemoth is, like, a great card. I love it. Uh, but it's the... And Rari's even this is, this is even kind of a fair fair card. It's It can be interacted with. It's totally fine. Costs a bajillion mana. I just really hate the feeling that... Someone has to answer this at the table and that they get this big tempo disadvantage and they're the ones that kind of saved you. So one thing to get around this is that Vorniclex is a jerk card for jerks. <laughs> but also the person that takes care of the Vorniclex for the rest of the table, you owe them. So like do them a favor and like don't attack them for a little bit. Give them a pass to be able to have their mana untap again and just focus your attention on the jerk player. Two things I want to say here. Jerk card for jerks, we're calling it, because Mel Lee called it that in Game Nights. I don't <laughs> like actually calling people names because of cards they play. That's a joke. Two, every time someone plays a Vorinclex, if I'm the one that's going to destroy it, I'm going to make a deal with them where I will only destroy it if they agree to what DJ said. Yeah. And I am totally happy to lose that game and let it stick around if they're not willing to make that deal with me. Because fine, I'm not going to put myself at a disadvantage to kill that thing. It takes over the game. Yeah, and they're going to win. But if you're not willing to play ball as far as like give me a pass until I can untap these lands, then 
then that's fine. You're actually the real enemy here. And I'll let the Vorinclex player win. And I will toe that line forever because I'm t perfectly happy to lose games for for to uh, establish that precedent. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of times float the mana, kill it, no big deal. I don't yeah. know. Vorinclex doesn't make me that mad. Card, it doesn't really make me mad, but I don't You don't play I it. I don't play it. You know what's weird? I do not own a Vorinclex. Do you have a desire to own a Vorinclex? No. So that's the thing is like, I'm not going to go out and just buy one because I don't really have a lot of desire. And I don't just happen to own one for whatever reason. I know that's not weird to a lot of people, but I do own most magic cards and I just don't have one. And I've never been like, you know what I need? Foreign collects. I own, I like Josh, I own most magic cards too and almost every commander playable card and I traded away my Vorn Clux. And you don't have one still? I don't have one. We both don't own a Vorn Clux? That's just weird. Okay. I'm going to go to my third one, which is was mentioned by um, Sheldon. It's Paradox Engine. Undoubtedly very, very powerful. And I just don't, I think, I, I, I'm pretty sure this is true that I do not have it any longer in any decks. Hmm. I had it in um, Rishkar. That was great in that deck because you play a spell and all your guys are mana dorks, basically. Um, but I took that deck apart. And now my Paradox Engine is just sitting there. And probably never will go into a deck again. I just don't feel the need to do that. I have it in my um, Karn Silver Golem All Artifacts deck because it uses so much mana ramp and like there's some combos in there oh, anyway. it's going to be sweet in that deck, yeah. And so it's just a fun, big mana rock and I like tapping and untapping stuff. It's cool. I love tapping and untapping stuff and I've got no problem going infinite doing that in like the Tim deck and stuff. And for whatever reason, Paradox Engine, I just... It just feels too easy, and so I, I don't know why. I just don't play it. But I think it entered into my Karn deck because Karn is at a huge disadvantage being mono brown, just like yeah. colorless. So you're like, this deck is already going to be it's, weak. So Exactly. Yeah. And I, I have a lot of decks like that where I'm like, okay, I'm going to have a powerful card in this deck because the whole way it's built is a little bit weaker. Okay, so that's it. We're just going to talk about three cards. I couldn't actually think of very many. <laughs> I had to force myself, and that's why Paradox Engine is a repeat. But you have an interesting point you wanted to make here about how people should view, you know, what we're talking about. Yeah. I think that the the core of, of Sheldon's article is really strong, where it's like, be critical of the cards that you don't play and the cards that are affecting your play group. There are sometimes cards that aren't even on this list that could be really imbalanced and toxic in your play group. Be really conscious of that and be conscious of the cards that make you happy when you play it and make you miserable when you play it. If Josh isn't having fun with the chaos cards, he takes them out of his deck. If he finds he's winning with, like I win with Crater Hoof Behemoth too many times, I'm like, that's not fun anymore, I take it out of my deck. If you're aware of what's going on, not only in your own deck, but in your play group, you can make it better and have more fun. You have an interesting point too here about, uh, you use constant miss as an example. You want to talk yeah, about that? Yeah, so I want to talk about uh, a specific example. One of my example. favorite cards, how dare you? Yeah, um, and by the way, this isn't a thing, don't play constant miss, but I use constant miss as an example because in some play groups, it literally shuts off creature strategies. This is a fog that's repeatable because you can buy it back by sacrificing a land. So you and can fog every turn at a certain point. Exactly. And there's, there are some play groups where let's say Josh's favorite deck is the new lands deck and he's got constant miss. And whenever he draws constant miss, uh, player Jimmy can never play his aggro deck or never play his, Craig can never play his attacking infect deck. And it's That's just, why I play that card, by the way. Yeah, exactly. But it's just a card that kind of has stifled the growth and the enjoyment of the play group. And it might be winning Josh games, but it might not actually be improving the play experience of your group. So what Josh might want to do is say, do you know what? I'm going to try and get that effect still to try and avoid dying to infect, but maybe I'll play Arachnogenesis instead. Still a fog, puts a bunch of spiders onto the battlefield. What's that counter spell that has buyback? Um, um, forbid? Yes. There's a card I don't play. Okay, there you go. Because it's just feel bad. But Constant Miss is different because I feel like, hey, listen, if you got to win through combat damage and you don't have a way around combat damage, that's your own fault. If you don't have a way around me countering everything, that's probably that might be my fault. <laughs> yeah, but but that's in your but that's in your specific yeah, play exactly. group. In some play groups where it's like, no, my it's an angel deck, I attack, and like your you have this thing that influences. Like you don't have to get rid of that effect. Just maybe switch it up to see how that see how that plays. Try a different effect to see if it's fun. See if there are cards that you do that maybe 
make a larger impact on the play group than you think because there's by no means this constant miss a broken card. Yeah, I, it's funny because uh, at a GP once I was playing and I constant miss somebody when they attack me and they literally like pause for a second thought and they go, man, I'm trying to think if I have a single card in my deck that can beat constant miss. I don't think I do. And I was like, okay, that sucks. So I wheel of fortune and showed him. I was like, okay, I'll discard constant miss so that your deck has a chance now. But do you see what I mean? Like that was yeah. you actively saying, I want a good game of magic. I so don't, yeah, exactly. I don't want this person to feel like, well, I'm going to sit here, but there's no way for me to win. That's just dumb. That just doesn't feel good um, for anybody really. So I think, you know, the people that don't think in that manner and don't avoid cards sometimes and just say like, well, I like this, so I don't care what anybody thinks. That's, you know, that's within your right to do. However, you're probably some percentage of you, some high percentage are the same people that email us constantly being like, my play group kills me first every time. Why? <laughs> probably why? I mean, if, if I'm the angel deck and you're the one with constant mists in your deck, I might attack you first. It, even if it's not in that deck. Yeah. You're just that type of player that's not, doesn't care if I'm going to have fun. So why should I care if you're going to have fun? And that's kind of like turnabout's fair play. And I think that, listen, it's totally fine. You just got to get, you got to be willing to take your lumps back if that's what you're doing. If you're going to play Winter Orb, you got to be willing for somebody to combo you out or whatever. Like, you know, like I was saying, yeah. if, if, okay, if we're playing mean, that's totally fine. You just can't complain when everybody else plays mean. And playing mean could mean just attacking you first every time. I think also that what happens is that when when you have that tension back and forth, sometimes the tension is good and it's fun and you guys are like playing back and forth and then they're gonna add Throne of the God Pharaoh to get around your stuff and that's a great dynamic. But when that dynamic doesn't exist, then you're, you have to think about the health of your play group. Um, and you can encourage that dynamic and be like, hey, like I got you a Throne of the God Pharaoh for your deck. That's an active thing that's like, hey, like we're, we're a good play group working together. We're going to have more fun. And it's not always about winning and beating up with the other person. Yeah, I think that and and in closing here, because we're getting pretty long, I do want to yeah. say also the, the onus is on somewhat, not just the person playing the Armageddon, but the person who got the get, is getting the Armageddon played on them. If you're going to just basically make the statement of like, that card's a jerk card for jerks. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to, instead of trying to ever really beat it by what my deck is doing or what cards I'm putting in it. I'm just going to complain about it every time. You're also part of the problem. You should be like, oh, that's the type of effect that's going on. Let me find some cards that maybe should combat it. Now, that doesn't mean I like the card all of a sudden, but at the same time, like just immediately going to writing that off as like that's a, that person's a jerk and that card's... Or combat it with conversation. If you say that's a jerk card for jerks, then like what's your response? Are you calling me a jerk? Exactly. Instead, it's like, <laughs> instead, if you have the conversation about it, you can sort of readjust your play group. The, an arms race where the person that, you know, buys the most expensive thing or like builds the next deck or does the next thing isn't always fun either. Right. By the way, sometimes it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, well, like we just said, we own really all fun, magic yeah. cards. So for us, it's we're not, like, we're like, the Josh arms race is not like buying cards. It kills it's, me. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to this up a notch like, yeah do okay that. well i'm gonna tune my deck to tonight next time we have commander night but i like that a lot i like that i like that but too. for a lot of people i totally understand like that would require them to buy a bunch of cards and maybe that's just not a thing you can do for yeah. us we just go open boxes and be like oh that card and this card it's different yeah and it, and it makes sense when there's because commander is such a great format because so many different people play and you gotta if a person with a pre-con is in your commander group like think of them too because otherwise they're just gonna stop playing commander all right to the listeners what cards uh, do you wish were out of your playgroup? Or actually, I, I like this better. What cards do you not play with mm -hmm. that you know are good or whatever, or, or just you don't play with them because you don't like the feeling when you play them? It's probably Paradox Engine. <laughs> For all of you out there that are a little bit obtuse and you're thinking, man, I need to buy some Paradox Engines because that card is really good, go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone and use that affiliate link to order your cards. Or maybe you should order Cross and Grip. Ooh. To get rid of that paradox engine. Because man, there's nothing better than when your friend just has that smug look. They play their paradox engine, like what do you it doesn't matter <laughs> what you do. You know, I got force of will in hand, and I'm even if you you know try and instant speed removal it, I'm gonna Josh, be able to Josh, go off in response. They just flash yeah. it to you. They just, they show, just show it to show you, it to you like oh I hate that when people just show it like, <laughs> are you gonna concede? Yeah. No, it resolves cross and grip. Good night.
cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Also, if you want to buy any Eclipse sleeves, you want to buy cool playmats, you want to buy all this Black Lotus theme stuff, Ultra Pro has it. You can find it at your LGS or at online retailers. Okay, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. I have something cool. So I did that. By charity. the way, that was half of the phrase. Something yeah. cool outside the world of magic. Sorry, I have something cool, but it's inside the world of magic. <laughs> it's okay. It's yeah. A good one. Once in a while, this happens, and so here's what's going to happen. I am. Have you heard of Pi Gal Magic? I have. Okay. First of all, we need to come up with a better name for it. So that's going to be part. That should have been the two of the listeners. I'm going to teach you all to play Pi Gal Magic, and then hopefully in the comments we can come up with a better name for it. It's called Pi Gal because in casinos there's a casino game called mm -hmm. Pi Gal where you have three cards in your hands and there's a lot of um, draws. Pi Gal Magic is something that I'm going to teach DJ, even though he know, already knows how to play, mostly to teach you all. It kind of replaces Pack Wars as a good way to open packs but play Magic that's not sealed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a really good way to like crack a booster box. You're going to do that anyway to look for the cards that you want for your decks. You're looking for Assassin's Trophy or whatever else. But if you do it with a pal and you play the games, all of a sudden the booster box opening becomes a day of playing games prize packs where you just have like three and you're like am i gonna save these for a sealed or like no i don't want to go home yet let's let's play some magic so dj and i are going to explain pi gal really quick and play a game of pi gal just so you can check it out uh but we got to switch camera views so we'll, we'll go to that okay so pi gal magic my new favorite way to play like fast games of magic while opening booster packs so the first thing we got to do is get some booster packs i, so, I like the first step okay here, i'll let you pick one okay and I'll pick one. So, Pico Magic is very, very simple. Here's how it's gonna work. So each player is gonna open their pack, and then you're gonna remove the token in the land, just like normal. Okay. Each of us is gonna, using only the cards in our pack, we're gonna build four three-card decks. So each deck will only have three cards in it. Yes, there's uh, 14 the 14 cards, cards in, the yeah. in the pack, so two cards will not be used, which is good because some cards are really, really bad, and I'll explain that now why. We're gonna build four three card hands, three card decks, and then we're gonna play four separate games. One of my three cards against one of your three cards, okay. except you start with five life and infinite mana, and you cannot be milled out. I'm, I'm gonna win this game. Yeah. I'm so gonna you, win. So like the best card in Pi Gal Magic is like Lava Axe. Cause yeah, it's just like- Yeah, cause you just kill someone. Dome you for five. Or uh, a five power creature with haste. If you go first, you can just play it and immediately do it there's cards that like make tokens like say it costs three and a white make a token well you can make infinite amount of tokens because you have infinite mana so yeah. that the cards like that are really good so okay you ready to deck build yeah okay so let's build our decks you ready to go all right i'm ready to go okay i, th I think i have good decks oh we need to determine who's gonna go first one of these is a locket if you choose the locket you go first okay all right, so you're gonna go first. Going first is big game in Pi Gal Magic. It's pretty advantageous, because if you have the haste creature or something, you win. Or if we both don't have haste creatures, yeah. you know, you have to block. Well, let's say we both bad. have Lava Axe. The oh, first yeah, player yeah, yeah. that goes just wins, because yeah. the other one never gets to cast it. Okay. Okay. So you remember, you have infinite mana and only start five life. In fact, I have an app for that. Ugh. All right. Okay, your go. I'm gonna play a pass while adept. <laughs> That's really good. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the turn. Because of infinite mana, right? He can make it unblockable. Okay. I'm going to play a Veiled Shade and a Rubble Belt Boar. Veiled Shade. Pretty good with it? infinite mana. <laughs> bajillion, bajillion. Oh, oh, and the Rubble Belt Boar will give the Veiled Shade a uh, plus two plus oh. So. You got it. <laughs> I still feel like I'm going to lose, though. Go is, it, is it my turn? Go ahead. It's your turn. Uh, I'm going to activate this and make it unblockable. Yep. I'm going to attack. For one? For one. No blocks, obviously, since okay. it's unblockable. Okay. Take one. I'm going to cast... Uh, Direct current targeting you. I see what's going to happen here. <laughs> I'm going to cast it again, discarding a stupid wall. <laughs> Did you more to you? Yes, yes, it happens. All right, so DJ's up one game. <laughs> see how cool Pi Gal Magic is? Or whatever we're going to call it. Okay, I go first on this one. I'm going to play a Rosemane Centaur and a City Watch Sphinx. <laughs> Those are pretty good. This is my beef deck. <laughs> These are pretty good. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm going to play a Light of the Legion. Yep. And I'm gonna deadly visit your uh, one that can actually kill me with that can deal six damage. Uh, uh, I'm gonna fail to surveil. Yep. And I'm going to pass the turn. All right, I'm gonna attack with my Rosemary Centaur. I am gonna block. All right. 
Go. I am going to attack you for five. I'll fog. <laughs> <laughs> that turns out to be pretty good. All right, Except all right. for the yeah. fact that I have you no fog. other cards you in fogged. hand. Okay, good. Uh, pass the turn. All right, you win. Man, 2 0. I got to go 2 0. 2 0. And you go first this game. Okay. This is this is magical too. <laughs> Burglar Rat? I'll discard a Demir Informant. Man, Burglar Rat, really good. I know, right? <laughs> a third of my deck <laughs> iron shell beetle yep i'm gonna put a counter you know what the rat deserves a counter it was working hard so i'm gonna put it on the on the rat okay so the rat's a two two yeah and okay. then i'll pass the turn okay i'll play watcher in the miss i can't surveil go ahead i'm going to play this boar yep and pump this and attack with both of them so we've got a three two and a, a just and a, a two, three two. one a three uh, one. Oh, it only gives two oh yeah yeah okay i will block the the beetle sure okay i'll take two and go to three Yep. All right. And then I'll pass the turn. Okay. I will swing for three. No blocks. Okay. Go to two. Go to two. Okay. I will Assassin's Trophy the Rubble Belt Boar. Oh. <laughs> Fail to find. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. You also pulled an Assassin's Trophy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, the attack for my rat. Yep. Go to one. Pass the turn. Attack for three. Yes. Dead. I, okay. Dead. I have a chance to tie it up. This is the last game. Here we All go. All right. Last game. Uh, I'm going first on this one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got the burglar right here. Okay. I'm going to play a Loxodon Restorer. I'll go to nine. <laughs> That's so much life. Uh, and then I'm going to play an Ornery Goblin, and I will pass the turn. I'm going to collar the culprit, your elephant. Okay. Elephant dies. All right. I am going to cast a Swarm Guild Mage. Yep. And then I'll play an affectionate Edric. Oh, no. I'm going to choose to fight your goblin. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I'll give him plus three plus three. So it kills your Endric. That's fine. Yep. You got me. It's just going to take five turns. <laughs> All right. Yay. Woo! So you took me down three Victorious. to one. So that's Pygal Magic. Uh, if you can think of a better name, please put it in the comments. Okay. Let's get back to the podcast. Okay. So that was Pygal Magic, but hopefully... You guys are going to help us come up with a better name for it. I really would like people to learn about this because it's a super fun one way to play. I teach people at GPs all the time. But if it's called PyGal, then Wizards can't really get behind it. <laughs> yeah. Because it can't be involved with gambling. So uh, I'm counting on all you guys. And also, I'm counting on you to go to Jumbo Commander on YouTube because that's DJ's YouTube channel. That's me. That's right. He has tons of deck techs. He has all kinds of... You're doing uh, arena videos now. I did some singleton videos. Yeah, arena's fun. And so I'm like, I'll just kind of try to stream this stuff and record it. Yeah, it's it's fun. And Hopefully singleton like on arena is sweet. Yeah. yeah. And DJ, of course, has deck builds, really cool deck builds on arena. Mm -hmm. Also tells you things like when you should pick up certain cards at rotation, when they're going to be the cheapest. If you like the command zone and you're not subscribe, subscribed to uh, Jumbo Commander... That's just inconsistent. That doesn't make any sense. So go over there and subscribe, please. For consistency sake, Yeah, for please. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and you should also check out the Masters of Modern, who are our sister podcasts, Alex Kessler, Ben Bateman. They talk about the modern format and all things competitive magic. You can find them on uh, Twitter at the MMCast or right next to us at collected.company. Our editor is Josh Murphy. Murph. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for this beautiful days behind us. I, I know you've been enjoying the little birds floating behind our heads the entire time. I Thank you. I keep murmuring MTG. mystic. Yeah. Oh, sorry. At Living Cards MTD. That's I stepped right. on you. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye, everyone. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com. Or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>